Why no one had ever accomplished polyphonic note separation in this way before is something even I don't know. There's no trick to it. Normally, music is understood as something that people make, but for me, music exists even without people. That sounds perhaps a little absurd. Earlier in antiquity, a distinction was made between musica mundana, the music that had always existed as such in the world, but not sounding, but as an idea, and musica humana, that which is made by human beings. By the same token, music already exists for me as an ideal essence, before it's made by human beings. So music has nothing to do with sound waves? No, it is merely realized through sound waves. Made audible, in other words. There are many statements in philosophy to this effect. For example, Leibniz said, when we hear music, the mind calculates unconsciously. And hence, the pleasure we derive from music is in fact pleasure in the relationship between the numbers. But when I say numbers, I'm always afraid of giving the impression that I'm referring to something dead. Numbers, however, are living structures and relationships. For instance, the ratio 2 to 3 is not only a 2 and a 3, but a proportion, the interrelationship of two entities. And it is these relationships that we experience in music. Look, a hummingbird hawk moth. They really look like hummingbirds. Music actually consists of numbers, of numerical relationships. For me, that is what constitutes music in its essence. When you sing a melody, an interpretation is added to it, perhaps as the expression of a feeling. The actual musical element, however, is already there before the feeling, and I can perhaps make use of an especially well-suited melody to express a particular feeling. That which is musical in the melody, however, is more comprehensive and earlier in origin than the feeling for which I'm making use of it. I always hear, so to speak, the interval relationships when I think of a number. When I hear the number three, I experience it in the quality of a fifth. The Pythagoreans said that the entire world is number. They were referring to the very direct relationship between numbers and musical intervals, and also to the fact that the smaller the number, the more distinctive the interval. For the small numbers are actually the big ones, at least that's the way I feel about it. A number such as 3,750,895 may be very large, but it's insignificant. The larger the number, the more arbitrary it is. If I subtract 20, it's in principle still the same number. But a 1, a 2, or a 3, these are the really big numbers. If I say 1, there is as yet nothing else. 1 is the whole, and 2 is the octave. It brings nothing new either. We say C, 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 it's always the same note. We experience it only as a variation in brightness. The number three is the first to bring with it a new note, a new quality. The old tuning system of Pythagoras, for example, is based entirely on the number three. To each new note that is formed by the three, another three is applied. This is a monochord, in the strictest sense of the term, as it only has one string. They say it was with this that Pythagoras conducted his experiments. Not with this actual instrument, of course, but with one just like it. Did you make this yourself? Yes, I made it myself. 
With an instrument like this, the Pythagoreans discovered the numerical ratios in music. The underlying graphic here shows which notes are located where. If, for instance, I stop the string here, at the halfway mark, the octave sounds. And the nice thing is that this graphic initially has nothing to do with the string and the notes, but is simply a representation of all the rational numbers. In this case, all the fractions up to a hundred. Here's a hundredth, two hundredth, three hundredths, and so on, one ninety-ninth, and so on. What I find so impressive is that the numbers are not arranged uniformly or amorphously, but exhibit an inherent structure. The number two in the middle here, and the number three, are more isolated from the other numbers and have larger gaps around them. That's what I mean when I say the smaller the number, the greater it is. This now is a different view of the order of the numbers. In this case, they're arranged like the Greek letter lambda, which is why this diagram is known as the lambdoma. Here we have the one, the two, the three, four, five, and so on, which the ancients understood as musical numbers. And this would be the direction in which the overtones, that is, the integer divisions of the string, lie. Mm -hmm. So two would be this one. Exactly. And here we have the reciprocals, that is, a half, a third, a fourth, a fifth. When you now apply it to a string, here are the string lengths, and these here could be understood as frequencies, or the other way around, the relationship is complementary and reciprocal. When you continue this schema, you can construct for each overtone an undertone series. Or the other way around, for every undertone and overtone series. And then you get this diagram, which is called the lambdoma. I prepared this one in advance. Two divided by five, for example, is here, and so on. All these lines, the equal tone lines, they converge here. That's not self-evident. Geometrically, perhaps it is, but I find it purely as a symbol very beautiful. If you pursue it, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, here, for example, is 0. Half 0, a third of 0, everything that lies here on this side is 0. And if I follow the numbers on the other side, then I have here 2 divided by 2, 2 divided by 1, 2 divided by 0, which mathematicians describe as undefined. 3 divided by 0, 1 divided by 0. That means here we have infinity, and here we have 0. And here, where the two lines meet, is zero divided by zero, from which all notes emerge. Not from the infinite and not from nothingness, but from where the infinite and nothingness meet. That's the point from which all notes emerge. As an image, I find that simply beautiful. Here, once again, are the equal tone lines, which we've just drawn. And here, too, they converge at the point zero over zero. Here I can now set all the intervals, for example, 2 over 3. More precisely, then we have the fifth. The large whole tone is here. Where exactly? 16 eighteenths or 8 ninths. The small whole tone is found at 18 twentieths or 9 tenths. So the interval is slightly smaller. I think I have a favorite interval, which is 5 to 8, the minor sixth.
The ancient Greeks, initially understood by mathematics, only geometry. So I'm very old-fashioned in this respect. Grasping, touching and making things contributes to a better understanding of them. I'm very haptic in this respect. Programming also helps to make things that I only imagine initially on a theoretical level more concrete and easier to grasp. When I have captured something in an algorithm and observed the results, it helps me to grasp the concepts inwardly. Is it a coincidence that you keep your notebook next to Kepler, the great astronomer? This is where I keep everything to do with Kepler and harmonics. It's near the dining table, and the notebook is there for reference. But Kepler's The Harmony of the World is one of my main sources of inspiration. The Harmony of the World is, in fact, what it's always all about. In the book, Kepler describes the relationship between the musical harmony of the world and geometry. This is a musical chaos pendulum. We wanted to translate into music something normally represented graphically as chaos or fractals. It's always fascinated me that a simple mathematical formula can produce a shape, as is seen with the Mandelbrot set, or in the form of other fractal images. Take, for example, these images. Fractals function in such a way that you have a very simple function, perhaps just one line of program code. And this is then repeated indefinitely so that structures emerge from it. That are all self-similar. It is a reiterative process, and it results in self-similarity, which we encounter constantly in nature as well. Yeah, it's just this that I find fascinating, that conformity to a very simple law, such as an angle of ramification, can give rise to a particular shape that allows us to distinguish one thing from another, to say, for example, this is an oak and not a beach. I think that similar processes are to be found also in music. Simple numerical relationships are nested and interact in complex ways to weave a fabric, which we experience then as music. If one double slash horizontal filter mit fi minus filter? No, it's just a hyphen. Bindestrich unten zunächst mit einem Nachbar 0,25. Okay, what does that mean? Did you write it like that yourself? Yeah, I wrote it that way. It's a bit abstruse. I write the actual program code in English, but my comments in German. <laughs> When we're programming, we always try to give the variables and functions names that allow you to read the code as though it were text. Instead of having variables like x1 and x2, we give them names like the frequency of such and such. You can call these things whatever you like. The main thing is for the code to be as easy to read as possible. So that future generations can maintain it. Uh, that too. But mainly for my own benefit, since I wouldn't understand it myself after three days if I were to start writing X1 and X2 all over the place. Another activity requiring precision, a different type of precision, of course, to that involved in welding a mouse. <laughs> yeah. 
Do you sometimes need that? You could say, when I do it, I realize how much I've missed doing it. I don't do it because I say I need to do it sometimes, but when I do it, I notice how good it feels to make something really tangible again. Are your tools always fit, or do you often have to resharpen them? These I have to resharpen. How long does it take to make a guitar? Uh, a good week or thereabouts. I used to give a lot of courses for interested amateurs that would last around 10 days. Someone with a certain aptitude could almost finish a guitar in 10 days. Maybe not the varnishing, perhaps, but so that it's playable. And what can someone with a little aptitude achieve in 10 days of programming? <laughs> um, Nothing. That's my father in his radio shop. What year was the photo taken? Must have been about 1953. TVs? We didn't have one until 1962. No, it was 53. The first programs in Germany were broadcast then. Can you remember any? In 53? I'd only just been born. <laughs> Did your father like working with his hands? Yeah, I remember very well. When we went on holiday, for the first few days I could really relax. But then he'd start hankering to make something. He had a real restless nature. He was searching for a new direction. There was a time when he kept saying he wanted to emigrate to Canada, but there was no concrete basis for any of that. Was it a good business? Yeah, it was profitable. Where was this? Bua, which is a small village near Osnabrück in the northwest of Germany. Then you moved to southwest Germany, to the Black Forest. You were all uprooted, came to the Black Forest, and then your father died. Yeah, a year after we moved there. How old were you then? I was 14. For a 14-year-old in the throes of puberty, it must have been very difficult. I didn't think so at the time, probably because I didn't want to. At 14, everything's in turmoil in any case. But it showed itself in the fact that I lost interest in school and only had time for the band and hitchhiking around. But when I say band, let's say the first band attempts. I screwed a pickup to a campfire guitar and connected it to an old radio. My brother played a drum set made out of detergent drums. But I wanted to make music from a very early age. Somehow, it was always on my mind. So you were totally captivated by music. Yeah, really though, I don't know whether it was the music itself or the feeling and the lifestyle that went with the beat and the rock scene. You can never really separate them. And I was also very much on a quest spiritually. Abandoning civilization, I began to roam the black forest with only a sleeping bag and a book about edible herbs. I didn't want to take any money with me either. You hadn't a red cent on you? Not one red cent. How old were you then? 21. I was lucky in that I always had somewhere to sleep, but it wasn't for very long anyway. I'd heard of a spiritual community in Switzerland on Lake Thun and just set off in that direction. In die Richtung gegangen und ähm, dann hielt ein VW Bus neben mir. And then a VW bus pulled up alongside and asked where I was headed. I hadn't even been hitchhiking. It turned out they were from the very same spiritual community I wanted to go to. I spent three years there. While I was living in this community, I read a book about physics and natural philosophy. In it, there was a footnote with a reference to a book entitled History of Harmonic Pythagoreanism by Rudolf Hase of Vienna. The title alone struck such a chord with me that I knew at once it had something to do with me. 
When I returned from Switzerland, I thought I'd start with something in the way of handiwork. At some stage, I hitched to the Black Forest to see my mother, and on the way back, I was picked up by someone going to Lake Constance. I knew there was a violin maker there, so I said, I'll travel with you to Lake Constance. So I just turned up one afternoon at the violin makers and said, I'd like to learn here. And the leap to the PC, how did that come about? I'd familiarized myself with the Atari on a guitar making course. This was what, 1984? Around there somewhere, 84, 85. I had a publishing house at the time for astrological tools offering things like calendars. Until then, I'd always prepared the print materials for the calendars by hand, but realized then it would be far better to program a computer to do it. You could show relationships on the screen, such as the course of the planets or fractals. And the Atari also had a MIDI interface, with which I could translate movements into notes and output them in musical form. That was also very creative. When you heard the first results of your research, did you think, now I'm heading in a really new direction? No, that wasn't yet the aim. I was more interested in tinkering with individual sounds. It was only when we asked ourselves, what does a stone sound like, that I combined this idea of local sound with a detection of individual notes within the sound, and it was from this that Melodyne gradually emerged. We were sitting drinking ouzo and tried to imagine how it would be if a stone were a sound. What does a stone sound like? If you take a stone like this, for example, you see that it has a shape, a form, a certain appearance. So I conjectured a stone is something the shape of which could be translated into sound. To put it in another way, if I understand this stone as a sound, how can I make it audible in a concrete sense? And naturally, the Converse question, from which Melodyne arose, how can I obtain a sound in a three-dimensional form like this? By which means, the sound could then be freed from its dependence upon continuous time. This sculpture is actually what emerged from this. May I hold it? How heavy is it? Is this stone? No, it's a piece of plastic. But it's good and heavy. Yeah, this was derived directly from musical data. And this thing, this object is this note. It's best visualized from left to right. Time runs in this direction, and that is the amplitude. Mm -hmm. If I turn it, it's three-dimensional. It has a depth. What does this third dimension signify? The depth represents the timbre of the sound at any given instant. You can see here, for example, very clearly, a structure that is somewhat triangular. That's because in this sound, the third overtone, the fifth is particularly loud, and that introduces an element of threeness. Since Melodyne didn't exist yet, and I was simply experimenting with a translation of the sound into this shape, I worked for almost a year with this one sound. You know it well, then. I know this sound inside and out and by heart. This also provides a good illustration of local sound. That means I can not only play back the sound, but I can also enter the sound at any point and move through it as slowly or quickly as I like. I can even linger in the sound. and move forwards or backwards. So, if I examine one place here... Go around it. Exactly. And is that really new? Did that not exist before? 
Ten years ago, it was new. Recently, DNA, direct note access, was added. With it, I can also edit polyphonic music. In other words, I can edit individually notes that sound simultaneously. Such as, for example, a guitar recording. If I now play a small chord, we see here the three notes I've just played as separate entities. Let's just listen again. And now, as if by moving my finger to a higher fret, I can raise this one note. From the divided up audio, I've isolated this one note and can move it up or down at will now, to any pitch I please. And why was no one able previously to isolate individual tones within complex material in this way? I honestly don't know. In science, the natural tendency is to begin with something simple, a sine wave, for example, or an individual note, and analyze that first, only to discover when the material becomes more complex or has to be treated in its entirety that the system doesn't work. My approach is different. I actually begin with complex signals, and it's only when I want to examine something in detail that I go back to simpler ones. But first, I have to have an overall impression of what is actually happening in reality. Does the secret, perhaps, lie in this role? <laughs> this is actually a loo role. <laughs> the question originally raised by the stone was, how can I translate a given sound into a three-dimensional form? Here, I've arranged the individual sampling values of the sound, indicated here by one, two, three, and so on, in a spiral. And it turns out that if you interpolate between the points, a landscape emerges that also represents the individual cross-sections in the sound. How old is the role? Twelve years. So that idea is the wellspring of Melodyne, of all that we've seen today in your test program and applications used in recording studios all over the world. Yes, but this manner of coiling up the sound would no longer be of use for polyphonic material, which calls for a different approach.